Uh, yeah, like, uh, my name's Adam. I'm one of the leaders here at Ferndown as well. Uh, and I am loving, thank you Kev, for drawing our attention to the sunny day today. I'm loving. Uh, it's nice, isn't it? My mum, when we were praying this morning, she spoke about being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And it feels like that as, as winter turns to spring, doesn't it? Like I, I scarified and mowed the lawn yesterday. It just feels like a... <laughs> It's good, the sun is shining. And I've been watching the golf on the telly, which is also good. No, 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 amen to that. Nobody likes golf here. <laughs> yeah, all right, everybody turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm gonna, we're going to go straight in this morning. I've got a great, great scripture. If this scripture, if you can get this scripture into your heart, this particular verse, it can change your life. Am I bang in a bit. Let me just move it away from my cheek. Um, it can change your life. If you could just take hold of the truth of this particular verse that we find in Ephesians 3. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus and he says this in verse 20. He says, let me get it on the screen. In fact, I'm not going to read it. We're all going to read it together nice and loud, okay? Don't read it in your Bible because you might have a different version. Let's all read it off the screen or from one of those two screens. It says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Great, good job. Um, I should do that again. Okay, I love this verse, and it's just a brilliant verse. We've been talking about more. Last week we talked about more, and Kevin just referenced you know, the word that we had from God at the beginning of the year, expect more in 24. And here we have it in black and white or in blue and yellow. It says, him who is able to do immeasurably more. The Greek word for more, it's a great word. It's, it's the word uh, perisos, and it means more, it means beyond, it means kind of more than you would expect. And then what Paul does, he puts, he puts the word hyper in front of it, hyperperisos, which means like abundantly more, so much more, infinitely more, far beyond you, the, uh, anything you can ask or imagine. So it makes me ask you, what have you been asking God for? What have you been needing God to do in your life? What have you been imagining that he could do? Let me tell you, he's a God who can do immeasurably more. Like more, so much more, you can't measure it. We should expect more in 24. So if we can apply that verse to the word that we had. Uh, do I go into, yeah, let's do a bit of Greek here. Like the word logos is like, it means word. Okay, the Greek word logos, and we find it all the way through scripture. Logos is that in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. Logos is a word, right? And, and when it's referring to scripture, it refers to what we read in the Bible, that's the logos. All right? But sometimes we get what's called a rhema word. Okay, that's another word that means word, but it means a word for now. It means a relevant word that for my life, for right now. So we've got the logos word, which is this. God can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And we combine that with the rhema word that we've had as a church, which is to expect more in 24. And the two things together should create an explosion inside you. It should, it should be me think, okay, well if God, I should be expecting more, I should be changing my posture, I should be changing the way I live, because if I can expect more, and I'm worshipping and serving a God who can do immeasurably more, my goodness, what could happen? What could happen in my life? What could happen in this church if we expect more? Now in last week's message, we were talking about the difficulties of life. Has anybody had any difficulties this week? Yes. Yes, yes. A few of us, many of us, most of us have been battling this. We've been having our challenges. We've been climbing that mountain this week that we talked about last week. And you know what we said, when we face difficulties, when we face trials, when we face the uphill battles, there are three options available to us. We can quit, or we can camp, or we can climb. No, we don't want to quit, and I don't think we have any quitters here. Because people who quit, they don't actually end up living in the fullness of God. If, if, if you quit at the first start, sign of, of difficulty, then you're never going to actually get to the place that God wants you to get to. So I don't think we have any quitters here. 
And camping, you know, it's okay to camp for a little while. It's okay to get your breath back. It's okay to, to stop, take pause, go, okay, God, I need, you know, I've just been going through it right this week. I've been going through the ringer and I need to pause. But you never take your eyes off the prize. Uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah, it says, it says, those who wait on the Lord, okay? And that's what you do when you camp. It's like you wait on God. But it says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. You're going to wait on the Lord, you're going to renew your strength, and then you're going to rise up on wings like eagles, and then you're going to run and not grow weary, and you're going to walk and not grow faint, because there's a purpose to resting, and that is so you can keep climbing. It's not, we don't stop and get comfortable, we stop to get our breath so we can keep, our, keep climbing, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, searching the things of God. And today I want to focus on a guy in the Bible, a guy that you will have all heard of, um, who was, I guess at times, maybe he was tempted to camp, or even to quit, okay? Um, And he's such a vivid and tangible picture of my life. Because I don't know about you, I'm sometimes tempted to quit. I'm sometimes tempted to, to camp and go to my comfortable place. And you know, when we read the Bible, we look, at, we look at Jesus, and I love Jesus. And I love reading, I love that we have his, his, his account in the Gospels, and we can read all about all he did. We can read about the miracles that he did, the way he loved people, the way he fed people, the way he healed people, the way he did everything right. The fact that he was sinless and was able to become, take on my sin, and die on the cross so that I could receive salvation. I love that. I love the tale of Jesus. You know, and it's good for us to aim for Jesus. But sometimes, often, we aim for Jesus, but we hit Peter. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? We aim for Jesus, but we hit Peter. We aim to live the life that Jesus told us we should live. We aim to to make him our template. But I don't know about you, but I often get it wrong. Like, I mess up. I take the wrong path. I lose my faith. I start to question. Let's look at Peter's life and we're going to look at Peter's life today. And hopefully in this, we're going to realize that yes, even though we have valley points, we have mountaintop points, and you you know what I mean. Sometimes we can come on a Sunday and we can sing, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. We're going to sing that at the end again, I think, because that is so relevant. Like, in the battle, I'm going to sing. In the middle of the storm, I'm going to sing. We need to, sing. We need to worship like that. And we, can, we can come on a Sunday and we can all sing together. The band is playing and it feels like angels are river dancing across the room. Like because God's presence is here. But then Monday morning, your coffee's not quite the right temperature. The Tesco man hasn't quite delivered what he said he was going to deliver. The kids are playing up. They haven't done their homework. And you go, oh, I'm not feeling great. I've got to feel a cold coming on. And you go, oh, you know, where are you, God? Where are you, God? Because we aim for Jesus, but sometimes we hit Peter. And we say things that we regret. And we do things that we know we shouldn't. And we, we, we believe things that we wish we hadn't believed. And if that's you, according to the Bible, you could make a great disciple. And I could make a great disciple. If that's us this morning, we need to be inspired by this and look at Peter and um, be encouraged. All right, so Peter, he's introduced to us on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter's a fisherman. He wasn't quite smart enough to become a disciple of a rabbi. I don't know if you know this, but uh, all all kind of little Jewish uh, children, they would have gone to Hebrew school. And they would have started their education, and they would have learned scripture, they would have learned Torah, they would have learned um, also, you know, the, the Bible. And, start the, and those who were clever went further and further until eventually, you know, they kind of know most of the Old Testament, and they get picked by a rabbi. You can be my disciple, you can be my disciple. The rest of you, you go back to your father and take on your father's, you take on your father's trade. And that was Peter. His dad was a fisherman, so he became a fisherman. And we meet him on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, um, and he's been out fishing all night. He's an ordinary guy. He, you know, he catches fish, he sells fish, he smells of fish, he cleans nets. But the one thing he's got going for him is that he's got a boat. 
He's got a boat. And so Jesus sees him in his boat and he says, can I come in your boat? And Peter says, yeah, you come in my boat. And Jesus goes into his boat and he pulls a little bit off the shore and, and then he teaches from Peter's boat. He teaches the crowd who are on the shore from Peter's boat. And it's great. And at the end of his sermon, he says to Peter, okay, Peter, what I want you to do, I want you to go a little bit deeper into the Sea of Galilee and I want you to put down your nets again. And Peter's like, oh. And we can see his reluctance in the text. He's like, oh, I've been fishing all night and I've caught nothing. They're not biting at the moment. Like, do you really want me to do it again? And then he's, he says something a bit faithful. He says, well, because you're saying it, I will do it. And we all know what happens. He catches the biggest haul of his life. Like, this massive boat filled with fish. And at the end of this kind of moment, Jesus says to him, follow me. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. And Peter in a great moment of faith, he puts down his nets, he leaves his boat, he leaves that great big pile of fish that he's just caught, and he starts to follow Jesus. And you're thinking, wow, Peter, what a man of faith to be able to do that. And it's like, it's like the moment of salvation. I was thinking about this. It's like the moment when we, when we came to Jesus for the first time and we gave him our heart. We gave him our life. We realized that actually life with Jesus was going to be more than life without Jesus. We realized that life with Jesus is going to be better than life without. And in that moment we say, God, I will, I will be with you everywhere. I will follow you to the end of my days. And it's a great moment. And we can say, look at Peter, what a man of faith. But then... We turn a couple of pages in the Bible and we find him on a boat again with his disciples. And uh, and it's it's actually Jesus' fault. Jesus tells them to get in the boat and he gets on the boat with them and he falls asleep. And then suddenly a storm rises up and they're on the Sea of Galilee and the, the boat's rocking backwards and forwards and the waves are coming over the side. I'm guessing it's raining. And most of these guys were fishermen who fished the Sea of Galilee for their entire lives. They knew all about storms. But this one, they're convinced they're gonna die. It must have been a bad one like it was a terrible storm I don't know what the storm you're facing at the moment but maybe maybe it feels like it's it's the worst storm you've ever had I know some of your stories and I know some of you are going through some really difficult things but Jesus is in the boat and they get to the point where you know what happens they wake Jesus up and Jesus wakes up and he looks through blurry eyes and he says peace be still not talking to the disciples, he's talking to the storm. And the storm stops in that moment. And we can feel like that sometimes. We can feel like God is absent and the storm is unbearable. And what happens? Our fear rises up and our faith gets pushed down. Our fear rises and our faith diminishes. And you feel like God is absent. And this is what happened to Peter in that boat. His fear rose up and his faith went down. And then in John 6, we see a very famous account. The feeding of the 5,000. Well, actually, it says there were 5,000 men. So most commentary, most uh, theologians say, well, actually, it's probably more like fifteen to 20,000 people, including women and children, like a big crowd of people listening to Jesus. And they know they want to feed them. All they've got, though, is two fish, five little loaves of bread. That's all they've got. And Jesus prays over it, he blesses it, everybody gets fed, and there's 12 basketfuls left over. The maths doesn't make sense. I wish I'd been there. Like, what a, what a miracle. How would your faith be built if you'd seen that? Like, literally, two fish, five loaves of bed, fed 20,000 20, people, and there was 12 basketfuls left over. God is not bound by the economics of this world, because God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. He can do more. And so he does this amazing miracle. And I don't know if you've ever seen a miracle like that in your own life, where we bring a measly happy meal and God transforms it. I know when I was growing up, I've, I've told you before, uh, when, we were in our, when, I was, when I was a child, we had lots of people coming over and staying and just stopping in for dinner. And my mom, almost every meal, she would pray over the chicken that it would feed everyone. Literally one chicken and we'd feed 25 people with this thing. But she would pray over every meal, wouldn't you? 
You would, you would pray out. And, and I grew up in that environment where it was just normal. They're like, okay, we haven't got enough food, we've got too many people, let's just pray over it. Well, we can't afford to go and get more, let's just pray over it and God will provide. And he always did, right? Every time. We've got to let our faith kind of dictate how we respond to circumstances. And it's a real faith boost when we see God come through. It's another high for Peter and the disciples. Man, you can, you see, did you see what Jesus did with this food? And we've got all these baskets. We've got a basket each left over. Like, what are you going to do with your basket? I don't know. I'm just going to eat. But then a few verses later, literally in the same chapter, chapter, Jesus is talking about this and he's giving a sermon. And he says, I am the bread of life. And then he says something really strange. He says, you... Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life in you. Now, of course, we know what he's talking about. We know the context of it because we've seen what comes later in the Last Supper where he's talking about the bread and the wine. He breaks the bread, he gives the wine, and he, he says, you know, do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't explain himself at this point to these people. All he says is, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you can imagine going, did he say, did he say fish? No, I think he said flesh. Okay. And he says that a lot of the crowd, they just walk away at that point. They're like, I'm not having any part of this. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter, because Peter's always the one who speaks up, he doesn't come back with a resounding affirmation. He doesn't come back with, well, we've just seen you do amazing miracles. We've seen you calm the storm. We've seen you heal people. Of course we're not going to leave. That's not what he says. What he says is, he looks around and he goes, where would we go? Like, I've got nowhere else to go. Like, there's a bit of faith there. He says, you have the words of eternal life. He says, we've come to recognize you as the son of God. He said, but, but where would I go? So there's, there's a little bit of faith. and There's also a little bit of unsurety. And I don't know about you, but I'm sometimes like that. I sometimes have some faith. But there's a part of me that's not quite sure, that has a little bit of fear in me, and, or not quite faith-filled. Like the guy who comes to Jesus asking him to heal his son. And Jesus says, well, anything's possible for he who believes. And the man says, well, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Because we can live in both of those things at the same time. We can believe and be unsure. And in this moment, Peter's like that. And I can have those moments too. It's all part of life's ups and downs. Matthew 14, they're back in the boat again and another storm comes up. And it's another storm that Jesus has sent them into. But this time Jesus isn't on the boat. This time Jesus walks to them on the water. I know I'm telling you all these stories and you know all these stories, but I like to tell them. Is that all right? And Jesus is walking to them on the water. And the, and the, and the disciples in the boat, they're all fearful. They go, is it Jesus? Is that Jesus? Is it a ghost? They're like, is it Jesus or a ghost? And they're a bit afraid. But then Peter, brilliant Peter, in this moment, it's fantastic. He says, if it's you, Lord, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come. Is that you, Jesus? Tell me to come to you. Because this is his rabbi. And he's like, well, if my rabbi can do this, then I can do this. And in this moment, he's got faith. And Jesus says to him, it is I, come. Come. And Peter steps down out of the boat and he has an amazing moment. Verse 29 says this Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. If only that could have been the end of this chapter. Verse 29. We all have these verse 29 moments where we feel like, oh God, I can do anything. I'm ready to raise the dead. My faith is up here. And this is my verse 29 moments. But we also sometimes have verse 30 moments, right? Because the next verse. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. No, I'm not going to have a go at Peter for this. Peter's just walked on the water. And, and I think he walks on the water again. He doesn't say it. But he's out of the boat. He's, he's gone a few paces. He's gone towards Jesus. And it says they go back to the boat together. And I don't think Jesus is dragging him through the water. Like, I, think, I think Jesus is lifting him up. And they walk back together. Like, 
And so I'm not going to have a go at Peter, but there is this verse 30 moment. Moment when, and I have them, when I move my confidence from Jesus and put it on my circumstance. When I start to think that the circumstance has power over me. And we talked last week, didn't we, from Hebrews 12 about keeping our eyes fixed. Fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever seen a, a uh, dancer, particularly a ballet dancer. They're spinning round and round and round. What they do, they do something called spotting. I think maybe you know what spotting is. And they, they find a, a, a place to look at. And their head stays in that place. So their body's turning and they keep their head there. And then they whip their head around and, and look back at the place again. And, it's, and so they can spin around and around. But their head just flips around and keeps spotting. Keeping their eyes fixed on that one place. So even though their body's kind of going all over the place. Their eyes are fixed on the one place. And that's the same is true for us. Even though we feel like we're in that storm. And our bodies are you know, being, being ravaged by, by our circumstances. And we're going through it. If we, need to, we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Like the psalmist said, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. That's where my help comes from. We lift our eyes up and we keep climbing. We have verse 29 moments. And we have verse 30 moments. Mountains and valleys. A couple of chapters later, Jesus and the disciples are together. And they're having a discussion about who people say Jesus is. And the disciples say, well, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say that you are John the Baptist. Some people say you're Jeremiah. Some people say you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus kind of puts a spotlight on them. He says, well, who do you say I am? And again, Peter has a brilliant moment. And Peter speaks up because he always speaks up. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus, I can imagine him sitting there, just jumps up like, yes, touchdown. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Peter, you got it right. Amazing. He said, you have not thought of this yourself. It's been revealed to you from God. You've got God, you know, you're listening to what God's saying. I can imagine Peter says, your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. Because his, his name was actually Simon, but Jesus was going to Peter, which means Rocky. He says, I'm going to call you Rocky because he says, you're, you're like, a, like a little rock. And I imagine Peter just kind of going, yeah. Bum, bum, bada, bum, bada, bum, bada, bum. Like I've got the ear of God. I can, I can hear what God's saying to me and I'm Rocky. Anybody know what happens in the next verse? Anybody know what happens next? Okay, so Jesus says, yeah, first prize to the guy with the beard. You've got it right. And sometimes I have moments like that, so certain, my faith is sky high. And then the next verse, Jesus starts to tell his disciples, says, yes, I'm the son of the living God, but this is what's going to happen. I'm going to get arrested, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to be put to death, but I am going to be raised to life. And Peter's still in the background, he's like, I'm rocky, I'm rocky. He hears Jesus say this, and he says, oh, hold on a minute, oh, no, 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 Jesus, that's not how this is going to play out. Come and have a chat with, with Peter. Come and have a, let, me, let me tell you, let me give you a better plan because that's not a great plan. All right? And Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Ouch. Oh, that's got a sting of it, right? Right on the back of Rocky. No, he's Satan. Like we've been called like, no, you're not listening to God anymore. You're listening to the devil, mountain high, valley low. You can imagine, I don't know if you've ever had your feelings hurt by somebody. You've never been called Satan by Jesus, right? That's going to need freedom in Christ, that is. Do you see what I did there? Freedom in Christ this week. It's a good thing. Get there, all right. Mountain high, valley low. Peter and me and maybe you too. All right, the next chapter, Jesus invites Peter, James and John to a conference. He says, the three disciples, he says, come along with me, we're going to go somewhere, we're going to go to a conference. They go up a mountain and on this mountain, Jesus gets transfigured before their eyes. Jesus starts to glow. His face is glowing. His clothes, like they're like white, they're like, They've been washed in personal automatic. They are glowing. His face is glowing. And then suddenly two old guys appear. Moses appeared and Elijah's appeared. 
All right, you've got Jesus, you've got Moses, and you've got Eliza all on the mountain. You've got Peter, James, and John over here, kind of watching what's playing out. And you've got Moses, you've got Moses and Elijah and Jesus, kind of having a bit of a having a bit of a conversation together. Beautiful moment. Like, there's all sorts of symbolism going on here. Moses, who God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Moses represents the law. And you've got Elijah, who had his own moment on Mount Carmel, like where he, he saw you know, the prophets of Baal destroyed. And uh, Elijah's there. He represents the prophets. So you've got Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. These guys are representing the old covenant. And Jesus is there as well, representing the new covenant. So you've got the old and you've got the new all together, all talking together. And then Peter sees this and thinks, hmm, I need to be a part of this. And he sticks his head in and he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he's like, you can imagine Jesus going, oh. Fortunately, God steps in at this point because the voice of God, suddenly the audible voice of God is heard. A cloud comes down and God says, this is my son Jesus, whom I love. Listen to him. Peter, shut your face. Listen, listen to Jesus right now. And it's like the old covenant has gone. There's a new covenant. It's time to listen to Jesus, time to listen to the new covenant. The time of the law and the prophets is past. And there are times and there are moments in my life when I need to stop talking and just listen. I need to stop solving and just get in his presence. Because in his presence, actually things start to work out anyway. If I'm busy trying to solve it and talking and, and putting my own pennies worth in, I'm not going to get the more that God has got for me. So that it's in his presence that things are going to change. And so we come to John 13. Jesus with his disciples, they go back to Jerusalem. And they have their last supper together. And Jesus does something new and different in this moment. Um, he's about to demonstrate something incredible about the nature of following God. And it said that in John 13, it says, knowing that God had put everything under his power, under his authority. He says he takes off his coat, he gets a bowl of water, puts a towel over his arm, he kneels down and he starts to wash their grubby feet. He kneels in front of James and he washes his feet. In front of John, he washes his feet. In front of Thomas, in front of Judas, he washes his feet. In front of Bartholomew, he washes his feet. And then he comes to Peter. And he's about to wash Peter's feet. Peter says to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. Amen. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. <laughs> he just goes, because he's got his feet in his mouth, that's why. <laughs> Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing. Sometimes we're not in the position to know why we're going through what we're going through or why the people we love are going through what they're going through. Sometimes we just don't understand. There will come a time when it will make sense. But in a moment, sometimes we don't realize what's going on. There was a time in my life when God told me to hand in my notice for the job I had and then not to apply for any jobs, but to trust him that he provide. I've told the story before. That was a fraught six weeks. Man, I was doing my, pulling my hair out. The day before I was losing my job, God provided a job. Like somebody came and it was a miracle. Sometimes we don't understand. But Jesus says to Peter, look, if I don't wash your feet, you've got no part with me. At that moment, Peter, who'd been all the way over here saying, no, you will never wash my feet, should have gone to the middle and gone, okay, yeah, wash my feet. But he doesn't because he's Peter. And he goes all the way to the other side. And he says, well, in that case, you should wash all of me. And he starts to strip off. Let's run the bath. I'll go and get the loofah and the rubber duck and we'll just do it. And Jesus is like, no, you always have to make it weird. Peter, no, I'm not going to bath you. I'm just going to wash your feet. 
you know, I'm just going to wash your feet. Stop talking. Later on, they head to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus asks his disciples to pray with him. And Peter, amongst the others, they, they can't stay up and pray. They keep falling asleep. And then the soldiers come and they arrest Jesus. And Peter, bless him, he takes a sword. He takes a sword and he goes to chop a guy's head off, but he misses and he chops his ear off. I don't think he was going for his ear. That's not, that's not good military strategy really, is it? But he chops off the guy's ear and you can see the guy there with blood coming out of his head and his ear on the floor and Jesus going, oh, not again. And he picks up the ear and he puts it back on the guy and he's healed instantly. And I don't know why, but that guy still arrests Jesus. The guy who's had his ear put back on. If that was me... I'm switching sides at that point. I'm going like, come on. Um, but Peter, he, he's like, oh, okay. And sometimes I can have my own passion, passion and my own zeal and I can misplace them. I can start fretting and fighting for the wrong things. I can start uh, fighting for a style of church or for a style of worship or for particular songs. And, and Jesus is like, look, just make the main thing the main thing. Don't get bogged down in the wrong things. Put your zeal into what you should be putting your zeal in, which is building God's kingdom. And so then we come to Peter's disaster. And this is the mess up that he thinks takes him too far. You know how he goes. He's in, Jesus has been arrested in, and Peter's in the courtyard. He's warming himself by the fire. That's kind of important. We'll come back to that. He's warming himself by the fire. And... Three times somebody asked Peter if he's the one who's been with Jesus. And Peter, just like Jesus had said, denies Jesus three times. And in that moment, Peter is devastated at what he's done. And he says he weeps bitterly. He weeps bitterly that he's denied his Lord. This is definitely a valley, a valley moment for Peter. And I don't know if you've been in that place where you just feel like you've messed up once too often. Oh, I've just messed up again. It's a big one. How can I come back from this? How can I come back? I haven't just let people down. I've let God down. And we let fear come in and it overcomes our faith. There's a great line in, in a song that Elevation Worship sing. It's a song called Gyra. The second line says, I wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. Oh, it's such a great line, right? Because we can't let God down. He knows you. He knows you too well. Sometimes we can feel like we have, but we can't actually. Because he knows us. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. So we know that Jesus is tried, he's crucified, he's buried in a tomb. On Easter Sunday morning, the women go to the tomb to finish anointing his body. And uh, we read this. Uh, They come, and there's an angel there. And the angel says to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Why would they put Peter? Why would the angel say, the disciples and Peter. Because Peter was one of the disciples. It's because he knows that Peter's gone off in a, in a funk. He's just like, you need to tell him that Jesus is alive. And then go ahead into Galilee. There you will see Jesus just as he told you. Go and make sure you tell Peter. Make sure he knows that Jesus is still around. And there's a lesson for us here in this. Whatever point we think we've come to, Jesus would say, Kev, Alini, Barbara, Sue, John, Jazz, Erica. He would say your name. They look, I want to meet with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Like, you haven't messed up. You haven't gone too far. Let's spend some time together. The devil would try and condemn us. John read the great, when we were praying this morning, John read a great uh, scripture from Romans chapter 8. Um, which talks about condemnation. The devil would try to condemn us. Now this word condemn, it's a building term. If you condemn a building, it means that building's no longer fit for purpose and all that should be happened to it is to be knocked down. The devil puts that label on us. He puts that tape across us and says, no, condemned. But Jesus and, and Paul, actually Paul writing in Romans, he talks about all the times he, he messes up. He says, I don't do the things I want to do. I do do the things I don't want to do. I keep messing up. And then he says that great line, Therefore, there is no no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus looks at you and he peels off that condemned sticker and says, I want to live in you. Whatever thing you are, whatever mess you think you've made of yourself, I'm going to come and I'm going to live in you. There is no condemnation. I want to be present with you always until the end of the age. And then there's this cool moment. I'm nearly done. There's this cool moment where Jesus kind of reconnects with Peter. Firstly, there's a, uh, Peter's kind of lost hope. He's gone back to his old life. He's gone back to his fishing boat. He's gone back to his fishing nets. And he's out on the Sea of Galilee. And he's fishing. And again, he's caught nothing. And there's this whole arc to the story. Isn't it beautiful? It comes full circle. Because he's out in the boat. And he's caught nothing again. Like in this moment. And then somebody on the shore says, uh, put your net out again on the right side of the boat. Which is an odd thing to do. I don't know if you think about it. Like there is no right side or left side. The water is the same. It's underneath. Like it makes no difference which side of the boat. The fish are in the sea. Like in there. Like it's not like a separate body of water. But anyway, so put your fish, put your net in the, in the, on the right side. And uh, they get this miraculous catch of fish again. Bringing the story full circle. Peter, he runs, realizes it's Jesus and he runs to him. And Jesus has lit a fire. Okay, and so what Jesus is doing is bringing Peter back to that moment because uh, he's lit, what the Bible tells us he's lit a fire. The word is anthrakia. Anthrakia, which is a fire made of coals. There's only two times in the Bible where this word is used for fire. And the other time was when Peter's in the courtyard denying Jesus. There are other words for fire, but this is the only two times where he, a fire with coals. Because Jesus, he brings you back to the moment of pain. Like, if you've broken your leg, you need the surgeon to work on your broken leg. You don't want to work on your arm, because your arm, but it's the most painful part. And that's what Jesus does in this moment. He works on the most painful part of Peter. He takes him back to that moment, and he asks him three questions, which kind of coincide with the three times that, that Peter denied. He says, do you love me more than these? And I think he's probably returning, referring to the boat and the nets and the fish. Do you love me? Do you love me more than you love your old life? Because your old life has got nothing for you. Do you love me more? And this is kind of winding Peter up a bit. And he, and he says, you know I love you. You know I do. And then what does Jesus say? He says, follow me. Follow me. He says it again. Bringing the whole thing full circle. Follow me. It's like a holy do-over. In golf. There's a, if you hit a bad shot on, you're on the tee, you're lining your driver up, and you hit a bad shot, there's something that amateur golfers do, which you say, I'm going to take a mulligan. Okay? Uh, sorry? Dominic. Dominic uses a mulligan, exactly, because he's bad. All right. So, you hit a bad shot, and you, and he goes off into the rough, you go, I'm going to take a mulligan. And that means you get to put your ball back down on the tee, and you take another shot. It's like, and it doesn't cost you any shots. It's not supposed to happen. It doesn't happen in the Masters, okay? They're not allowed to do that. And I don't know who Mulligan was, uh, like obviously a bad golfer, but there's this thing <laughs> in, where, where you say, I'm going to take, take a Mulligan right now. Like, I want to do it again. And maybe you've heard, like, God referred to as the God of second chances. I don't think that's right. Because what I need and what, what we need is not a second chance. Because the truth is, if we get a second chance, we're going to mess up again. Like Peter had chance after chance. He kept messing up. If I get my daughter, Eliza, to take a chemistry A-level paper, she's seven years old. She's not going to do very well. She's not going she's not to get any points at all. And if I go to her, okay, well, in my mercy and in my grace, I'm going to give you a second chance. You can do it again. She's still not going to do very well. What she needs is a substitute. She needs Dan. <laughs> because Dan is a, is a whiz at chemistry. And, he would, and he, he, she needs him to sit the paper for her. And that's what Jesus offers. He doesn't give a second chance. He offers a substitute, which is so much better. And in golf, if I hit a bad shot and I'm saying take a mulligan, I don't need a second chance. I'm just going to do the same thing again. It's going to go that way this time. What I need is Rory McIlroy to come and take my shot for me. I don't need a second chance. I need a substitute. 
Because it doesn't matter if I've messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up. Jesus is my substitute. He takes it all on himself. And he welcomes me back. Jesus is saying to Peter, follow me. But this time it's different. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. And you're going to do amazing things. Because now you've, I've paid for your sins. I've paid for your mess ups. Now there's a substitute for all your mess ups. And the next time Peter says anything, it's after the Holy Spirit has come in him on the day of Pentecost. And he starts to preach to the crowd and he delivers a hard message to them. 3,000 people come to faith and are baptized on that day. And so the thing that let Peter down again and again, his mouth, is the very thing that God uses to bring transformation from this point on with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus living in him. God knows what we are like, that we can aim for Jesus. If we could aim for Jesus and hit Jesus, there would be no need for a substitute. If we could aim for Jesus and live like that, there would be no need for him to come on to live on this earth and die for our sins so that we can be set free. That wouldn't be necessary. But because we aim for Jesus and hit Peter, because we don't do what we want to do, it's okay. Jesus pays for our sins and we still aim for Jesus I'm not saying we shouldn't do that we should still try and live the life that he's calling us to live and hopefully over time as we climb as we get more and more in tune with him as we come into his presence more and more as we grow as we expect more in 24 hopefully our lives do become more aligned as we overcome these difficulties that we face as we come through them and realize actually I'm stronger than I thought I was because I've got the Holy Spirit of God in me We're then equipped to face whatever the next challenge is because there will be a next challenge and the next battle. But we're stronger and we have a bit more faith because we know that he was with us last time. I moved mountains before and I know that he can do it again through me. That is all the more that we need. Band, can we come up? We're going to sing. I want to sing. um, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies again. But let's finish where we started. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. That power, that power that can do immeasurably more, that power is at work in you. That same power. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Are, you, are you inspired by Peter? Are you inspired that even though you're Peter, actually it's okay? Yeah? Let's expect more in 24. Let's sing this song, Raise a Hallelujah, and then we'll close the service.